Played cowboys and Indians naturally young when we were young in school. And I did like the, the idea of cowboys and Indians, but um, an airplane was forced to land in the pasture about a mile from our home. We all ran to meet him, but since I was one of the first ones to get there, the pilot picked me up and he put me in the cockpit. And I looked at the dials, I was caught and hooked. No doubt in my mind. And then I switched from Cowboys and Indians to Eddie Rickenbacker's Sam Brown belt and uniform. And that's how I got hooked on aviation from then on out. On January 31, 1943, First Lieutenant Jefferson de Blanc led an escort of Marine fighter planes to attack Japanese ships off Kolabangara Island in the Solomons. The lifelong aviation fanatic scarcely knew the danger he was flying into as formidable Japanese defenses and perilous distance conspired to bring the group's mission to an untimely end. Word came down from fighter command that a Japanese invasion fleet was coming down with ships to probably reinforce Guadalcanal for the final fight. So they scrambled us, eight fighter pilots, to go up there to escort 12 dive bombers to hit the Japanese destroyers and ships that were in the Kolomanga area, 250 miles out. Now that's beyond the range of the Wildcat. So we had to strap on a wing tank of 50 gallons to make it. About 100 miles out, I'd already used my 50 gallons and, and the main tank was not full. I was using gas like mad. There was a leak somewhere. I don't know where it was. In the meantime, two guys must have had the same trouble because they turned back and went back. So they left six of us to do the job of protecting the dive bombers. Now, I'm not a brave man, but I have to live with myself. I knew that I could go ahead and make it to that, but I could not make it back unless I leave now for base. If I quit now, that would be one less fighter pilot to go up there. I figured I knew enough about survival that I could survive if I hit the islands. So I decided to keep going. Our dive bombers were rendezvousing to go home, and they yelled that they were hit by float planes. So I left the system and went to the float plane. I burned two of them immediately, and the rest of them left. And about that time when I turned over 25 feet off the waters, that's when the zeros came. They did not see me first, so I got the first crack at them and burned the first guy, the leader. Shot him down, and that's when everybody broke up into dog fighting. I shot down a total of five airplanes plus one probable. The last two kills I had, they were above me coming down. So I had the better position. I had a mid-wing fighter, best platform to shoot from, and I put the pipper right above his cockpit, immediately exploded, and I flew through the pieces. But his wingman, when I saw him coming down on me, he was picking up speed and he was too anxious for the kill. You get too anxious. You've seen birds that way or animals get too anxious to kill. They, 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 they anticipate and they caught themselves. So he was coming down so fast that he didn't realize he was overtaking me. So then I chopped the throttle and I popped my flaps to slow me even farther. So he couldn't stay on my tail. He was coming too fast and we were wingtip to wingtip when we looked at each other. You either kill or you be killed. And you have no remorse for the enemy. He's out to kill you. So I knew, and he knew that he was a dead man, because he sensed it. There's only one way he could go. He couldn't go above me. He couldn't go under me. He had to pull up. And when he did, I burned him. So then I stood up, fat, dumb, and happy, 
And that's when I got hit. The first bullet came through over my left shoulder and took my watch off my wrist. And that 20 millimeter followed and hit the instrument panel. So I jumped out, trailed the edge of the wing and pulled the rip cord and it floated through the air. It was beautiful. And I'd never seen that. By that time, I was up to about 3,000 feet. Man, that was the most sensational thing I ever did in my life. Bailing out at altitude, DeBlond swam eight miles to shore. He survived for two nights in the dense jungle before being captured, not by Japanese, but by a tribe of natives. Traded to a neighboring tribe for a sack of rice, DeBlond was eventually conveyed to Australian coast watchers who returned him safely to his base. I didn't know I was going to get the Medal of Honor. First I knew about it was when I got a, a call from Washington to put me on active duty. I said, what? I don't, I'm a reserve. I'm not, I don't know what I, now he said, this is to come to Washington to get the Medal of Honor. I said, you got to be joking. I said, send it to me and write it. And they did. I was honored to get it, but I felt that others had done much more than I. I could have easily turned back and nobody would have questioned me because two guys did already. So I wouldn't have questioned me about my bravery, even if I was a leader to lead up there. But I would have to live with myself because no doubt in my mind, a lot of those bombers would not have returned into two men to a bomber. And that would be a part that I would have to, to be accountable for. And I don't like that. I took the medal for, for the guys who went down, you know, with whom I fought and who didn't come back. We got it together.